morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, um, I welcome all of you to this first conference, first in the series of two on uh, uh, COVID and cooperation. Uh, as you know, this is uh, uh, a first preliminary conference. There will be another one uh, uh, one year from now on June 2nd. The idea of these two tied conferences was uh, to put together papers that were uh, collecting, uh, still in the process of collecting uh, uh, data on uh, um, how corporation uh, uh, reacted uh, uh, under COVID. Um, so the uh, idea of the two linked conference is to have a more preliminary set of paper today and then more completed uh, paper later on. Um, my, my role here, my name is Paola Sapienza, uh, is simply to welcome all of you and give you a bit of a, a description of how we're going to proceed. Uh, we're going to have uh, uh, the event starting uh, with the keynote from the event sponsor. Uh, the idea is to bring uh, the institutional investor perspective uh, 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 as an investor in companies uh, to try to understand that how the pandemic uh, has affected uh, um, the in practice. Uh, um, and this is going to be followed uh, by the academic sessions uh, with papers presentation. We have six papers, uh, three papers uh, will be presented together and we'll have a discussion for the three paper and then we're going to go uh, uh, with the second set of uh, three papers and one full discussion. Um, there is probably unlikely uh, a, uh, a lot of time uh, for the Q&A, but I welcome everyone who is participating uh, to use the Q&A uh, in the, the electronic version of the Q&A. This will give the speakers the possibility of responding uh, um, in uh, 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 in real time, uh, if possible, or later on. No? Um, before I uh, we start, uh, I want to remind everyone that this was a dual submission uh, uh, conference, uh, and so I want to invite uh, both uh, uh, editors, uh, Itai uh, and uh, Andrew, uh, to uh, give you a bit of a perspective on the dual submission. So I'm going to hand it to them, uh, and then uh, we're going to start the conference uh, uh, as all. Well. Itai? Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Paula. Uh, so I am Itai Goldstein, uh, the executive editor of the RFS. And uh, I will uh, give you here a short introduction on behalf of the RFS and our involvement uh, in this program. So we have uh, a long tradition of dual submission conferences uh, at the RFS. Uh, and this is a pleasure to participate in, in this great uh, conference here. Uh, I should say that this is the first time that we are collaborating with one of the other SFS uh, journals, uh, in this case, uh, RCFS, and Andrew here will uh, speak on behalf of the RCFS in, in, in a minute. Uh, from the RFS uh, side, we received over 60 uh, submissions uh, that chose the dual submission track with uh, the RFS and eight of them have been uh, invited uh, to continue uh, the full review process and will be submitted uh, in the next uh, month or so. Uh, I should mention that uh, there are two editors uh, that are handling those submissions at the RFS and I am one of them, Holger Mueller is uh, the other one. Uh, we will continue to have the dual submission option uh, in the second conference that will be in a year, and we expect uh, another set of, of papers uh, there, so there will be another uh, opportunity. And uh, before turning it over to uh, Andrew, let me also mention that uh, we already received a lot of submissions dealing with COVID over the, the year and collected uh, a few of them uh, that will come out in a special issue uh, in, in a couple of months. I think this conference represents uh, papers that uh, were waiting for more data to, to come in. And this was certainly the, the motivation here uh, and will continue to be the motivation for the second conference we will have uh, next year. Uh, so uh, thank you. I hope you enjoy uh, the conference. And, and now let me turn it over to Andrew. Uh, thanks, Itai. Uh, thanks, uh, Paula. Uh, we are very pleased to be part of the uh, dual submission process of uh, the corporations and COVID-19 conference. 
a little bit of a background. Last year, we were the review of corporate finance studies, uh, which I'm representing as executive editor of the RCFS. We were uh, the first finance journal to have a um, special issue on um, an entire issue on COVID, and that was the first, um, the most early round uh, papers on um, on COVID, on the implications of COVID on both uh, corporations and banks. And we felt that participating in this conference would have added um, another important dimension because as more data comes along and um, more researchers get interested in this subject, we will get uh, more interesting and different um, takes of the impact of the pandemic on, on corporations and uh, the financial intermediation sector. We were very pleased to see um, a good uh, number of papers being submitted. They were submitted to the RCFS in, in total. We received uh, 35 uh, dual submission uh, papers. A good part of them were not uh, fully fledged papers. They were um, either early drafts or paper proposals. And we were um, specifically also interested in early proposals. And I'm very happy to um, report that um, six of those um, of those 35 will enter into the former review. And um, practically half of them are um, either early drafts or paper proposals. And that means that um, they will be given a longer period in order for the authors to, uh, to submit. And I'm also glad to see that one of the, uh, those five that we um, chose uh, will enter also, is also on the program. So overall, we were very happy with the participation and also we will be uh, looking forward to the dual submits for um, uh, next year's uh, conference. Thanks a lot. My name is Marco Becht, and I'm here to welcome you um, on behalf of the ECGI and everybody else, and to welcome in particular uh, Corinne Smith uh, from Norges Bank Investment Management. She is the Chief Corporate Governance Officer, and I think Norges Bank Investment Management or the Global Pension Fund needs a little introduction, and I think Corinne will say a little bit more about it. Uh, now, uh, NBIM, what's, there are many things that are special about NBIM. Uh, so the first thing is that it's such a large uh, fund that it invests so much in equity, but also that it doesn't do this passively uh, in the sense of not being engaged with the companies invests in. So they do have a stewardship officer, Corinne, and they are very much, they very much care about what goes on in their portfolio. Now, what's also special about them is that they have policies on E, on S, and on G. And these are not developed out of, by plucking things out of blue air, but they actually are a consumer of, believe it or not, uh, academic research. So this is true for the stewardship part. It's also true for the asset management and the asset allocation part. Uh, not only do they actually listen to top researchers, uh, but they actually also fund initiatives uh, to do with this. And they actually funded this particular initiative we have today and what we're going to have next year. I believe they also funded a special issue on climate finance of the RFS, and they always do this at arm's length. So they have an academic committee, and the funding is competitive. And we are very happy to have a past peer review uh, by colleagues, actually. That's maybe the great surprise uh, to, to be here today. So without, um, so in addition to all of this, of course, Corinne has deep insights into not just what went on, continue to go on uh, of her normal activities in terms of stewardship, but on top of it came all the challenges that COVID brought. And I think she is really uniquely placed to give us insights on those last 14 uh, or by now even 16 months uh, that we've been living through. So Corinne, thank you very much for agreeing to be here and we're really looking forward to your opening remarks. Hey, thank you, Marco, and good afternoon or good morning and greetings from sunny Oslo. And it's a pleasure to meet with you all virtually today. Uh, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to contribute uh, an investor perspective to this academic workshop on such an exciting and, and very timely topic. And we are an institutional member of the ECGI and we are very fond of the network. 
The ECGI provides us with access to leading research on governance and sustainability questions that are important to us. And at the same time, the ECGI often provides valuable fora to discuss public policy choices. So thank you for that. So uh, Marco gave a brief introduction to the fund, but let me uh, talk a little bit about a uh, little bit more about us. So we are the asset manager of the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, and we have a very clear mission, and that is to safeguard and build financial wealth for future generations. And the fund is owned by the Norwegian people. So we have, uh, we often say we have 5 million uh, clients. Um, it's the Norwegian Ministry of Finance that sets the overall investment strategy. And any major changes to this strategy require the approval of the Norwegian Parliament. And the operational management of the fund is then assigned to us, NBIM, and we are part of the Norwegian Central Bank. And our goal is then to achieve the highest possible return with moderate risk and responsible investment is a priority in managing the fund. And the fund was established in 1990 to support the Norwegian government's long-term management of petroleum revenue. And the idea really was simple. It was to transform the value of the oil, that oil and gas actually, that we pump up to the surface into a financial fortune. And today, the fund is worth more than twice as much as the remaining petroleum wealth on the Norwegian continental shelf. And it is one of the world's largest sovereign wealth fund with a market value of around 12,000 billion Norwegian kroner, uh, or that's more than $1.4 trillion. And at the end of last uh, year, close to 73% were invested in equity, uh, nearly 25% in fixed income and the remainder in unlisted real estate. And that means that we have invested in uh, more than 9,000 companies. So we have a significant global ownership on average 1.5% of all listed companies in the world. So uh, just to mention a few, we, we are a shareholder in companies like Apple, Nestle and Tencent. And uh, I would on that, basis uh, share some reflections on how COVID-19 uh, affected the fund and also our in investee companies. And this will then bring me to why we decided to fund this uh, ECGI project and what we are also hoping to achieve through our funding. So, so how did it uh, COVID affect the fund? And of course, COVID-19 surprised us like everyone else, leading to large and sudden movements in the financial markets. And of course, on a practical level, uh, like everyone else, every other organization and person, we faced demanding working conditions. But what's interesting is that we had the worst and the best quarter in the fund's history in 2020. So following a roller coaster ride, we ended the year with a return of almost 11%. And this was in part due to our exposure to tech companies that did, well, did very well during the year. And, uh, but of course, while the fund had, uh, has continued grow, to grow during COVID-19, you know, there may be a likelihood for a large market correction over the next couple of years, we, we will see. Um, but the oil fund, fund is, is not just a generational fund, but it's also a reserve fund. And the crisis showed how important this function is when Norway uh, is hit by a crisis. And we transferred to around 300 billion kroner, around $35 billion out of the fund during the year to cover the central government budget deficit, around 25% of the government budget. And also, like uh, many others, we, we had moved our data to the cloud just before the pandemic started. So this, of course, allowed us to quickly adapt to the situation and to start running the fund from uh, our kitchen tables and sofas and bedrooms, and uh, which, of course, is an experience we share with many other organizations, not the least uh, the companies we have invested in. So, so how did COVID-19 affect our investee companies and our engagement as seen from our uh, perspective and investor perspective? Um, 
and uh, in particular how we saw it from a stewardship uh, so my role as as uh, chief of the corporate governance work at the fund so so uh, my team carries out our responsibilities as an owner as a shareholder in more than 9000 companies so as marco said we engage with companies on governance and sustainability and we vote at all shareholder meetings where that is possible. So last year we voted on more than 120,000 resolutions. So initially in March last year, we, we temporarily reduced our uh, outreach to companies because we want to make sure that the company boards and the company's top management could focus on keeping their business on track during the crisis. But after a while, and when all company meetings became virtual, we actually realized that boards had more time for calls than before the pandemic, and they were easier to reach. I think uh, largely because all this time spent traveling had fallen away. So in the end, we had almost 2,900 company meetings last year, which is close to our the pre-crisis level. And one area where we observed significant change was in how annual general meetings were run. Um, the pandemic made, of course, large fiscal meetings impossible. And we approved, we approved postponements to AGMs and holding AGMs virtually um, where we could. And, and what we saw was that companies were often innovative in their response to the pandemic. For example, virtual AGMs were made available on company websites. And this allowed many more shareholders to listen to the meetings as compared to a physical one. Uh, but it, on the other side, could make active shareholder particip participation more difficult. So we encourage companies to find solutions that enable widened participation, but at the same time, allow shareholders to exercise their rights and be heard. When it came to executive pay structure, that did not change dramatically. But we saw that uh, COVID-19 triggered many adjustments. Companies argued that the pandemic was an external shock uh, outside management's control. So many companies revised pay targets downwards or adjusted metrics to remove uh, COVID-19 effects. Um, on the other hand, some companies also put in place temporary cuts to executives fixed paid and also um, to the maximum amount of incentive plans. Uh, but sort of on balance, uh, it seems that measures to maintain executive pay levels that were, were dominant. Um, as you all know, stock markets recovered strongly, in part due to huge governmental support. And bankruptcy and insolvencies were much lower in 2020 compared to previous years, despite this huge damage to the real economy. And what it really showed us was that many of the so-called long-term incentive plans have become overly complex. It's sort of multiple metrics that are open to discretion and adjustments. And this is not long-term and does not provide good incentives to management so in my view, these observations confirm the relevance of uh, NBIM's positions on executive uh, remunerations, also in times of crisis. And our view is really that remuneration structure should be simple, transparent, and expose the CEO to the long-term share price development. And my final observation is uh, on an era where we, I should say, fortunately, did not see that COVID-19 caused significant change. And that is how companies approach long-term sustainability challenges. We have for a long time had a spotlight on the relationship between sustainability and value creation. And we really want to understand how environmental and social factors could affect companies' profitability in the longer term and how companies address relevant risks and opportunities. And the pandemic showed us uh, how really a virus turned the global economy upside down. And it really made us reflect on how other external shocks like global warming could affect the global economy. And at the beginning of the pandemic, we had concerns that each short-term shock would lead companies to lose sight of long-term challenges. 
Uh, however, I think this fear turned out to be unwarranted, at least from what we observe. Uh, we saw many companies maintain their focus on sustainability and social challenges, and even launch new initiatives. And as a concrete example, we saw in our assess assessments um, of the companies a marked improvement in climate disclosures from the previous year. And I think this, this is very promising and suggests that the pandemic has not weakened companies' work on sustainability, but may even have strengthened it. But as I said, these are initial um, observations. We really need all your research uh, contributions to understand the deeper causalities and what really is going on. And that takes me to really explain uh, why we decided to fund this excellent ECGI corporations and COVID projects and what we are hoping it will achieve. Um, and of course, uh, you know, our return is dependent on sustainable growth, well-functioning markets and good corporate governance. And we support academic research to contribute to improve market standards and push further knowledge. So last year we launched a call for proposal on changing ownership structure and its implication for corporate governance. And you know the ownership structure of listed companies has changed quite a bit of the last decade, with large institutional investors like us having become significant owners. And we wanted to support new research projects to better understand how ownership structure may affect companies' uh, governance, corporate decision making, and their long-term performance. And we are also interested in research that provides new insight into how institutional investors can affect corporate governance at scale. And cooperation and COVID-19 uh, was uh, one of three winning projects. The ECGI convinced us and our uh, scientific advisory board with a bottom-up approach to encourage new research by launching a call for papers on, on cooperation and COVID-19. Um, and from our perspective, this was a very timely, exciting, but in a way also a slightly risky project. Uh, you know, you never know how much interest and what kind of submission such a call will ultimately attract. But speaking today, I can say that the agenda looks very promising with a range of insightful and imaginative papers. So I believe we are on a very good track and I am now looking forward to hearing the different contributions. So with that, Marco, uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne. So uh, it's the only remaining duty I have is to hand over to the conference chair, Rene Adams of the University of Oxford and an ECGI um, a research member uh, who is together with Paula uh, put together uh, this conference and who's also going to host us uh, next year in Oxford uh, to actually uh, be able to meet again uh, in person to discuss further. So Rene, over to you. All right, thanks very much, Marco. And uh, thanks everyone for um, participating in this um, slightly unconventional uh, conference structure. Um, my job, I asked to speak a little bit about the changing nature of the research landscape and um, that's very much related to why the conference is structured the way it is. Um, and so I put together some data with some co-authors. Um, so I'm basically borrowing heavily from my co-authors. Um, and uh, we tentatively are titling our future paper, um, which is not yet a paper, the pandemic papers, and you'll see why in a second. Um, okay, so, um, so how has the nature of the research landscape changed? Um, you know, we all know that there's been many papers on COVID, um, actually sort of like mind-blowingly many papers. Um, when, the, when the pandemic hit, I was still an editor at Management Science. And um, sometime around May, I had to resign my position because um, the numbers of papers just rocketed, you know, skywards. And I was just like, there's no way you can manage homeschooling and um, an increased editorial load, right? So that's just not possible. Um, but we thought, you know, so how, how does the situation look? Um, so we put together some data and um, this data comes from SSRN. Um, so there's, you know, I told you an anecdote about submissions to journals um, and there's been several anecdotes where people say the numbers of submissions have skyrocketed. 
Um, so this is pre, pre journal submission data, right? So SSRN data um, from the econ and finance networks, which is um, sort of somewhat interestingly about 80% of papers on the social science research network. Um, this is 2020 data, and I'm gonna just show you some graphs, which I think are interesting. And the graphs are all by a date of submission of the paper. Um, and um, not surprisingly, for those of you who know me, uh, we code gender. Uh, and uh, gender is gender of the corresponding author, because um, obviously many uh, papers are written in teams. Um, and just let me know if you can't see the slides. Um, okay, so uh, so this slide relates to why we're having this conference. Okay, so, so what does this slide show? Um, here we have the number of papers by subject. And um, down here we have the month of submission in 2020. Okay, so what are the subject categories? Uh, the yellow line, which you see is, um, is up here. Oh, sorry, I should um, also state these are COVID papers. Okay, so these are the numbers of papers written on COVID um, grouped according to subject. Okay, uh, so the yellow line here, the one that sort of stands way above uh, the others is um, econ. Okay, so what econ um, could this be? Presumably this is mostly macro. And why do I say that? Because the macro data um, is relatively easy to access um, and you know it comes out at a frequency that um, people can sort of you know, contempor contemporaneously analyze. Uh, now, what's the, the next um, subject, um, the next most uh, prominent subject? Uh, There's this blue line here, which is asset pricing. Okay. Uh, and then we have a red line for uh, both asset pricing and corporate finance, um, which is sort of the next one. Uh, and this green line down here, uh, this is corporate finance. Okay. Um, and so this relates to the, to the topic of the conference in the following sense. Um, you know, we, we were sitting in the pandemic um, as an, a corporate finance scholar. Um, I was seeing this flow of papers coming in uh, and nothing was on corporations um, and definitely nothing on corporate governance. And, um, and I was sort of like, well, wait a minute. Um, you know, we need to also inform policy. But uh, the point here is that we couldn't uh, because the data was not yet available. Okay, so, so corporate data comes at a frequency uh, that makes it much more difficult uh, to sort of um, analyze contemporaneously. And, um, you know, Paula and I said, well, we, we need to have some mechanism to ensure that, um, you know, the policymakers also get access uh, to high quality corporate research. And so um, that is why we designed the conference in a way where we said, look, um, you know, the, the earliest that companies will disclose uh, sort of retroactive data, for example, on governance for 2020 is essentially around April in the US when all the annual meetings happen, right? Um, and so then uh, we need to give people a little bit of time to uh, put, together, put together a proposal and then um, here's the conference, okay, where people can present. Uh, and then we need to give people more time to actually write like a high quality paper. And so therefore next year, um, there's another conference, okay. Uh, now, um, I, I'm going to go further with this data because what I want to highlight is, um, so I think this graph is interesting for several reasons. Um, it sort of highlights first that um, data matters for understanding um, what the academic community can reasonably say um, that's relevant for policymakers um, at any given point in time, right? So, so corporate clearly lags behind um, asset pricing and macro uh, just because data availability is not as frequent, right? Um, and I think it's important for policymakers to understand that because if you want quick answers, um, you're not gonna get them, okay. Um, now the data also lends itself to, uh, to showing some other um, aspects that I think are important for understanding uh, the research landscape going forward. Um, and this relates to the two sort of conference themes that sort of naturally emerged when we were looking at the papers that were submitted. Um, so one of the sessions is about working from home, not surprisingly. Um, another session is uh, about survival. Okay, um, so let me show you uh, just a little bit more data that uh, shows that the research community is not immune to these effects of COVID. Okay. Um, so this graph right here uh, shows um, 
the number of papers on SSRN uh, by month submitted. And now the interesting thing here is the red line is the COVID papers and the blue line are the non-COVID papers. Okay, so what we see is this huge jump up in May. Okay, so what does that suggest? It suggests that academics were clearing out their backlog during lockdown, right? So uh, lockdown hits and uh, what does everyone do? Um, some people write COVID papers, right? Those people who have the data, they write the COVID papers, uh, but those people who don't have the data, what do they do, they clear out their backlog. Okay, so, um, so working from home had an impact um, on the way that we work. Um, now, uh, obviously, then that raises some interesting questions. Who's working from home? Or how are people working from home? And uh, this graph shows that um, men were quicker to produce COVID papers. So these are the COVID papers. Uh, and now it's broken down by gender. So the blue line is the women and the red line is the men, right? So um, we've also heard these themes before that um, lockdown was um, difficult for women in particular, um, also that it was difficult for um, female academics. Um, but this also shows that, um, you know, the, the types of papers that women, that women were writing may have been different from the types of papers that men were writing. Okay, obviously one needs to, um, look at this data much more carefully in more detail, um, but it's quite suggestive that, you know, you see there's a big gap and a, a much bigger jump up for the men in terms of the writing of COVID papers. Okay, so uh, now why does that matter? Well, um, again, like we sort of have heard these themes before, but um, when we look at the data, what we see is that um, these early COVID papers sort of completely dominated both citations and views during 2020. So if you look at the at the overall citations of papers to SSR, two papers on SSRN during 2020, um, roughly 70% of those citations go to COVID papers. Okay, so, so the people who were quick with COVID, um, they definitely, you know, the early bird gets the worm type phenomenon. Um, they really uh, have gotten tons of citations. It's incredible how many citations some papers already have. Uh, on COVID. And so Andrew's strategy of um, uh, launching a special issue uh, definitely uh, is going to pay off in the long run. Um, okay, so, so let me just uh, highlight these graphs here. So what these graphs are, are citations um, on the left uh, by uh, date of submission. And so this is retroactive citations, okay? Um, and this is abstract views by date of submission. Okay, so um, I tried to put these in the same, you know, on the same, well, I put them on the same slide, but um, I should note here that the scales are completely different. This is 6,000. Okay, so some papers have 6,000 views um, that are on uh, COVID. Um, and uh, this right here, the maximum here is citations. Uh, the number looks small, it's 10. Uh, but those of you who um, play the in impact game in terms of academic citations, uh, you know that having 10 citations for a paper uh, that was just posted on SSRN uh, in 2020 is sort of incredible, right? It's very hard to get that level of citations, um, even for published papers sometimes um, until a certain time of, has elapsed. Um, so the COVID papers are being cited, um, you know, a lot. Um, they're being cited early. Um, they're being seen. Um, and of course, you know, then we think about, well, who's uh, able to produce the COVID papers? What type of COVID papers um, are there? Um, so it's going to be mostly econ, um, asset pricing papers. Um, it's going to be mostly papers written by men. And um, while we have not done this analysis, um, it's not hard to think that a lot of these papers will be written by seniors or people at top institutions um, who have potentially more resources. Um, so what is the point? The point is that these themes about um, working from home and survival also affect the research landscape. Um, you know, it'll be interesting to see whether COVID caused in some sense more inequality um, among academics. Uh, but I think it's important to understand that this is happening and that's exactly one reason why we had this initiative. Um, we said, well, we need to have mechanisms in place 
um, to ensure that um, you know, corporate is represented just as asset pricing is, um, that the juniors are represented just as the seniors are, uh, that women are represented just as men are. Um, and we also need to advocate for uh, more initiatives, um, obviously with university administrators, et cetera. Okay, so, uh, so basically, you know, this is just to say that the research landscape is not immune to the effects of COVID. Um, our own profession shows a lot of the results that, um, or a lot of the, the effects that we'll be talking about um, in more detail later that are specific to corporations. Um, and with that, I wanted to, I wanted to give Jiri an opportunity to um, maybe say a few words, um, sort of as a, you know, a junior faculty member, um, how he felt his experience uh, during COVID was. And so I'm gonna turn um, the floor over to Jiri and then Jiri is going to, has kindly agreed um, to chair the rest of the conference, um, you know, which is always uh, as, as people who are, you know, Paula and I, we both agreed that we're not um, fantastic timekeepers. Uh, so we're very grateful to Jiri for, um, for agreeing to, you know, keep us on track. Uh, so Jiri, over to you. Thank you, Rana. My name is Chiri Knessel. I'm one of the junior faculty members at the uh, Sai Business School, uh, working uh, not far from Rana. Uh, I'm happy to chair both of the upcoming sessions today. And now I would like to take a few minutes just to share my experience, how COVID affected uh, kind of a junior life. My experience might be a little bit different from what senior colleagues experience, uh, and it brought some advantages and disadvantages. I think that COVID brought three main disruptions or three main changes. The first one was that the typical ways of informal interaction uh, got disrupted. So we had to switch seminars from in-person seminars to online format. And by working from home, you don't get that much uh, interaction with your colleagues. You don't get all these ad hoc chats on corridors. You don't get lunches with colleagues. And this is not about chatting. This is really, this is a very important channel how to get pretty good feedback from, from more experienced uh, colleagues and how you can uh, develop your skills. The second change was in terms of teaching, we had to change to online format as well. Uh, now, seeing all the possibilities, uh, what you can do online, how you can educate and entertain students and what students start expecting and all education experts are suggesting. Uh, this was quite overwhelming and uh, asked for a lot of time investment. I was one of the luckier people because a lot of my senior colleagues took this on themselves and, and I was kind of lucky enough that I could keep focusing on my research. Probably the third disruption was that the official ways of getting formal feedback got disrupted as well. Uh, a lot of conferences got canceled. Uh, many of them uh, changed to online format. Uh, for me personally, uh, two small top conferences got canceled uh, uh, almost last minute. So I was uh, kind of sad about this. But COVID brought also some chances. And I was really happy when Renee announced that she would like to organize a small conference which would cover something related to COVID and corporations. So suddenly there was something to look for. And Renee made clear from the very beginning that she wants a high quality conference with high quality papers. And for this, we need data. So as she explained, uh, she intentionally Wait, wait it uh, until first set of official data is released and until we have a chance to, to write a good paper. Now, as many of, as many, uh, of you, together with my co-authors, we managed to write a paper as well. Now, we intentionally don't include our papers on the conference to keep it open and fair to, for everyone else. But the conference itself and the date of the conference was very important guidance uh, for us. It was something which kept us productive. It's something to look for. And it's something which gives you a chance to finish on time together with other people. And I guess that this is one of the ways how to stay productive uh, during all this uh, COVID uh, and all these different aspects of COVID and working from home, just having something to look for and uh, trying to finish on time. Now, looking at the conference program, I can see that many people were successful in this. 
and I'm looking forward to your presentations. Uh, that's everything from me. Thank you, Rene. Back to you. All right. Thanks, Jiri. Um, you know, I think sometimes us seniors forget that, um, you know, things are not so easy for the juniors, um, especially when they haven't yet developed the connections um, that might be useful for them to get new ideas and start new projects. Um, so, you know, I think I really appreciate that Jiri sort of reminded us um, of this fact. 